Hello, Escape Collective podcast listener. I'm Dane Cash, and I'm pretty serious about bike racing, so you can imagine just how excited I get this time of year, what with the Tour de France and all. And I'm also excited for you, because if you sign up to join Escape Collective right now, your first month will only cost $1. That means you'll get full access to all of our bike racing news and analysis, tech coverage, and everything else in between here on podcast channels and uh, also over the website. So you can expect us to be pretty busy over the next few months, and if you want to read or listen to what we have to say without hitting paywalls or missing members-only episodes of our podcasts, or if you want to talk bikes with the rest of our awesome community on our Discord server, it's a pretty awesome opportunity to join up. Plus, you'll be supporting everything we're doing here, and we really and truly cannot do this without your support. Head on over to escapecollective.com slash TDF to sign up, and remember, if you do it now, your first month will only cost you one dollar. Welcome back to the Escape Collective Tour Daily Podcast, everybody. I'm Kaylee Fretz. Stage 13? Yep. We had a bit of a day, so, you know. Hi, Johnny. Hi. (laughs) Hi, Ian. Hi. Uh, Jasper Philipson won a sprint today into Poe, which is where we're sitting right now. Would you just look at him go? I've I've forgotten what the Poe catchphrase is. (laughs) It's all Poe to us. It's all Poe to us. That's all Poe to me. That's all Poe to you, specifically. Uh, um, yeah, we had, a, we had a, a very hard, very fast stage. I think the average it was speed great. was like 48k it was an hour. A great stage. We had lots Those of echelons attacking. and attacking, and Matthew Burgadu attacked Burgadu. in the finale. Burger he boy. ran over so that he could watch his parents. How were they? I didn't speak to them because as I, I found out that Burgadu's parents were going to be there at the finish this morning when I was speaking to my one English-speaking friend at Total Energies. And then... I asked if I could have a little interview with them, and he said, no, they are very timid. Is this just what he says about anyone you want to talk to on that team? It's I, quite a good It's a timid jail. team, and Burgadu himself is quite timid, so I think the apple doesn't yeah. fall far from the... Uh, the pomme de terre doesn't fall far from the tree. Congrats. Good French word. <laughs> Technically, you just said the potato doesn't fall oh, yeah, from the tree. Pom. <laughs> no, but that's, uh, that's a good synergy to an article that I might get up tonight, depending on if I can translate and interview with him in a language I don't speak. We'll see. Uh, we can work on that. We can okay. work on that. Uh, let's return right. to the sprint real Sorry, quick. Yeah. Jasper Philipson wins the sprint, like, kind of going away. Like, won it pretty handily. Wavanar in second, Pascal Ackerman in third, Benny Germay in fourth. So, Germay's sort of consistency keeps him very much in the green jersey. I think his lead is now 75 points instead of 107, with really only one, like, nailed on to sprint Neem? stage to go which is the one into Neem yeah. I think I said three yesterday we've, so we've gone from three to one with only one stage but you know mild correction what's a it. sprint stage between friends well there's there's another one that's you like you never know when it could be a sprint could be it's got some cat threes in like the first half it's probably not a sprint well, stage it's probably not a Phillips sprint stage but it might be like a Wild Van Art and a Benny. sprint stage yeah anyway Gramai I would say with that ride today comes pretty close to solidifying his his New yep. Jersey, which is incredible. Yeah, amazing. I mean, I'm not sure if many people would have expected that at the start of the tour, given the sprint field. You know, yes, even yes, but I wouldn't have. I mean, I wouldn't have. I mean, Philipson won four. pretty easily, yeah. like four times last year, and, he, and every single, single time he did it, he won pretty easily. And the thing is, winning two stages of the tour is still a pretty good haul when he gets to the end. But it will probably feel, because he wasn't, as you uh, were saying, you said the sprinter du jour. Yep. Or well, sprinter du tour, sorry, not du jour. He, he still time. could, I mean, he could tie Binyam Grimai, right? But if it he would wins still the next be, one, it would be three to three. The green jersey would be the tiebreaker, I maybe. Would, I would think so. I yeah. would think the green jersey would be the tiebreaker at that point. Yeah, yeah. and, and Grimai has just been incredibly consistent. So not only has he won three stages, but he's just like in the top five almost every yeah. single one. Uh, and he's not here necessarily with the sprint train that we would have identified prior to the race as being the best one well Mike right? Tennyson's just pretty very Tennyson's capable amazing. yeah but yeah and initially they were kind of like almost working for well they were working for two sprinters but they've really obviously honed in and they've, they've done a pretty good job of putting him where, ne- where he needs to be he hasn't tended to win his sprints though off the back of a a big massive lead out uh, in fact nobody really is winning off the back of a big massive lead out this year the other thing that happened in that finale was a crash where I think it was Maxim Langhills 
uh, sort of tried to squeeze through a gap that really wasn't there. Well, so the Arkea rider had swung off. He had just finished his... his Capio, um, Amori Capio. Capio, yeah, who had just finished his, his lead out. And it's always a really dangerous moment because you've got rider who's just like basically completely let off the gas and riders trying to come around. Uh, I think Van Heels was a bit aggressive with his shoulder mm. in that. Uh, do we have a do we have yeah. a urine trouble? We sure do have a urine trouble did, for did, that. Did, did anything did anything happen to him? Uh, Fifteen hundred Swiss francs, Oof. which and is relegation? seven and a half wheeze by the side of the road. <laughs> Oh, at current okay. exchange rates. I'm going to look up 1,500 or 15,000? 15, 1,500. I think 15... Well, I'll fact check that, but I'm pretty sure 1,500? 1,500, that's 1,600, nearly 1,700 US dollars. So we should just remember that basically they're one for one going forward because I always forget the conversion. Every there time. are other so, countries in the world, Johnny. Yeah, he but, didn't get relegated, but he did get a big fine and 60 points in UCI ranking. Yeah taking it away so 60 UCI points taken away which does he does he care about 60 UCI points probably not <laughs> well I probably think if, if Lotto Destiny is trying to Get return promoted. to the world tour that's true imagine if they they're crucial if they're imagine if they away. lose by 60 points oof Whoa. or if they go bankrupt by 1500 Swiss francs <laughs> both potential <laughs> future scenarios <laughs> there was another thing that happened today which is that we, we released a big story that we kind of hinted at for a couple of days. Uh, we are, I'm just going to get this out of the way now, we are going to talk with Ronan, who wrote the piece, yeah. later in the show, because uh, we want to sort of dive into some of that stuff a little bit more deeply and provide some more context and, and whatever else. Um, yeah, fascinating piece. Uh, we've spent, you know, the evening on the phone with some press officers who are less than stoked. But, only uh, one. Only one. Uh, but it was the evening that we spent on the phone with him. <laughs> the others, yeah. probably almost definitely slightly disappointed probably in us. Probably there's some, there's some disappointment in us, probably. But that's from just because we've probably done a, well, Ronan predominantly has done a very well-researched piece with a lot of reporting in it. Yeah, that they don't like very much. Uh, anyway, we'll hear from Ronan later. I, I know that a lot of people were quite taken by the fact that we stayed at the same hotel as Ineos Grenadiers last night. So I've got I got an email from somebody who thought, I think we said it was a really beautiful hotel. Oh no! Oh, we no, were being no, no. And somebody thought I was. We were serious. Um, I haven't responded to this email yet. I will. I couldn't tell if he was talking about this one or the actual very nice hotel that we stayed at a couple days ago. I need to go re reread the email. I just read it in a in a, in a rush. Uh, but just to clarify, we were in a Campanile. Campaniles are not nice. I would say we've stayed in one really nice Airbnb, one really nice hotel. Llama. The Llama one. Yep. And apart from that, it's just been like tour hotel, which is yeah, fine. Which is fine. That's what we come here for. You don't, you don't come here to like, you know, lay around in, in a lovely suite. Is the nice <laughs> Airbnb the Live Laugh Love? No, Florence no. one. Florence. Yeah. Uh, Florence is great. No, the Live weird, Laugh Love was stairs. had no functional internet and no functional air conditioning, and it was in the roof. But it had sixty promotional messages to encourage sorry motivational messages I keep saying promotional they weren't promotional <laughs> promoting the motivation they, they weren't even motivational but they were trying to be one of them it also despite uh, the immediate outside area seeming not exactly the nicest place ever Kaylee did manage to leave the keys to the Airbnb in the front door, <laughs> the door. all night next to the bus stop quite a public space no one saw them nope so or walked into our room that, that you know, yeah that was <laughs> pretty much whatever town that was Orléans. Uh, Orléans. Ah, yeah. there we go. Sorry, I kind of interrupted you about the, uh, the Ineos Hotel. Ah, yeah, no, it was a shit place. Uh, <laughs> but on the plus side, there was like an integrated like hairdryer slash shaver Ooh. machine, which was pretty good on the wall. You might not have... I missed that. Ah. When you could shave with it? No, there were, like you flip up a little flap and then you can plug in your shaver. And I don't know what point the uh, hairdryer comes into it, but I think you might be able to like sluice away your stubble <laughs> I don't know that I didn't sounds... I didn't give it a go because I'm I'm going for constant like five day growth <laughs> this Tour de France uh, in other news whilst whilst we were um, in what term was that Villeneuve's a lot yep, yep. Uh, some French boys complimented me on my moustache they did they did that was good yeah they um, did and because I do not speak French I don't really have the nuances to whether that was a compliment or maybe a little bit of a mockery. but yeah, I think um, it was a compliment. Okay, well, that's good. This I, morning when the gendarme complimented you on your royal wave, Yeah, that the was royal a wave was a lot, I have to say. <laughs> that was a mockery. Yeah. yeah. What do you want me to do? Not wave? He called you the king of Aja. Of which what? Which is where the, where the <laughs> star, <laughs> star was. 
Yeah, okay. Do you, do you accept the crown? <laughs> I'll take it. Weary as the head. I, I had a lovely time in Arjun this morning. I um, spoke to my family on... That was quite fun. ...on video chat whilst you, the caravan was going past. They liked and then that, I think. The kids were loving it, and because the kids were on the screen, I got multiples of everything that they were throwing. Oh, nice. Which is really good. So is this I've, you lay in the seas to eventually get them over to the tour? No. In a magical mystery van? No, that, no, would, that be would be... Hellish. <laughs> Hi, Marie. <laughs> but... No, I mean, it would probably have its nice moments, but it's challenging enough following the tour, not with two small children. So I, I can't really imagine what it would be in an alternative world. My main notes uh, from the start are also caravan related. I watched Mark Maddio and Lenny Martinez get out of the bus. They were the first in the queue because everyone has to wait for the caravan to get past. No one interrupts the caravan, no matter who you are, even Mark Maddio. Uh, so Lenny Martinez, because he looks of age to be interested in the caravan that was quite nice to see even though he rides his bike very fast <laughs> so dad dad took him out to, yeah, dad, to watch the caravan dad, it was dad a treat. took him outside and then obviously everyone's going past and recognizes mark Maddio for various reasons just because you know he's he is mark, Maddio. He's, mark Maddio. he's on netflix he's like one of the probably the most recognizable faces in in french cycling sibo pino's dad as well i guess uh, yes. and everyone was in just, a way isn't he all of our dads <laughs> kind of yeah that, there's a t-shirt idea jared um <laughs> And he, everyone was waving at him as he, they went past, and he would just he would wave to everyone as they ah, passed. He didn't back. get bored of it, and he must do that every single day of his life at the tour. Should we be waving back at the caravan people because they do wave at us? I do wave. Yeah, yeah, we do. We do wave that. back. Yeah, it's, well, Ian um, does. Ian does. I yeah. try, and I manage about two, and I'm like, I'm bored of this now. <laughs> on the <laughs> on the way into Po, it was I, I conducted a little sociological experiment because we had to drive along the race route for the last few kilometers. And what you what you can do if you're in a car driving along the race route is you can wave at people. And I think it's like like a reflex response that if someone waves at you, you wave back. And the amount of just like blank faces, dead-eyed stares and people waving at me, no no obvious sign of delight. Um, so you don't think they, you think they're doing it just like... It's just like, like one of those... Automatic. One of those cats. Like when you're the doctors and it t- hits you on the knee with a hammer and your leg just goes up. Yeah, so I am the hammer. And the French public is the knee, but there was there was one there was one uh, woman that I wove at, waved at, waved at, waved at, waved at. What are we talking about right now? No, no, no. This is important. <laughs> <laughs> this is okay. important. Ian waving. <laughs> so I waved at one woman, and she was so pleased that she yelled out, "Messi!" Oh, that's nice. Which is nice. I've never been thanked for waving at someone before. Uh, one other note, sorry, Kaylee. French TV. At the end of the stage, they interviewed the Stinky King. So Ian, watch out! They're coming for everything you hold dear. <laughs> As long as I leave my beautiful Uno X boys alone, we're all good. <laughs> and then the TV switched into karaoke. Yeah. Yes. Real, so that was we, we a real weird show. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, back to the race for a moment. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, yeah. we are getting a little bit off the beaten path here. Uh, as we do. I'd like to say that it was a real uh, good shot for the beautiful boys from Uno X today. Was it? Yeah, Magnus Court was in a breakaway. Yeah. yeah. With a bristly moustache, which he might be dying a different colour. Oh, uh, yeah. A few more Instagram followers, so go and do that because that would be funny. Um, he, he had a bad hotel the other night. He did. Did you see that one? He there always posts the photos of his hotels, but last night was particularly <laughs> terrible. Uh, there was mold on the walls. There was Alexander Kristoff sitting in a bunker. He also has a really old school laptop. Alexander like, Kristoff? Yeah, no, no, uh, Magnus Court. Does he? It's like one of those big old black like Lenovo ones, it looks like, with the huge <laughs> power pack. <laughs> Which maybe is like a gaming laptop. Maybe he's there playing like, uh, what's that civilization game or something like that to really while away the hours. But I don't know, it's just me (laughs) guessing. Maybe we'll ask him. (laughs) Sorry. I think we must. Um, But also, Tobias Johannesson did did a good breakaway. He's having a a great talk. With Richard Carapaz. Can you guess who was ninth today? Tadej Pogacar. That's correct. Because I saw him in that overhead replay. He's absolutely sprinting for the hell of it. Oh, he's just fun, isn't he? What is he doing? He's just kind of fun. Yeah. I I was was chatting about this with Dane. Was it yesterday, the day before, about the sort of like how much energy is Pogacar wasting? And I do think that like in general, people kind of overestimate yeah. how much energy that is, or how much energy that like an attack takes. For example, like the hard part of an attack isn't like the thirty seconds where you go really it's hard. Like yeah, keeping that, it that, going. Yeah. That is hard. It's the fact that you then spend a bunch of time alone, doing a ton of watts alone for yeah. a while. Like you know, the the brief acceleration. Yes, it will take something out of your legs, but like that's not what's going to make a rider crack a week from now. My theory is that Pogacar is like uh, these electric cars where when you, as you brake, they like recharge themselves. But for Pogacar, it's when he attacks, is you know, refilling mm. the batteries. That's the only explanation I can think of. I think you're probably spot on. 
Yeah, it was just it was it was weird to see him up there, and you know, frankly, like with that big crash in the finale, it really highlights that it's risky to do that, right? Like you yeah. don't see Jonas Vinga go. Yeah, you see him on the front at three or five k to go, depending on when, where that marker is, but you don't see him on the front at 500 meters to go because that's when the sprinters are doing their crazy sprinter stuff. It's a culture clash. Would yeah. be better if they were both. I mean, I'm sure way inclined, maybe to not. To be clear, I'm here for it. Like yeah. I think it's great in general. But wouldn't it be a shame if, like, that's how this tour was decided? Right. right. Let's not speak these things potentially. Oh, we're knocking on, knock wood. on wood. Yeah. I'm just saying. Like, it it it, it struck me as a, a sort of needless a needless risk, right? Like, he takes lots of risks every day to win a bike race, but that wasn't to win a bike race. It was to come in ninth, right? And he was never going. Was never going. To, he was never going to be any further maybe he ahead loves UCI than that. Points. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Do or he is on my my fantasy team. He's yeah, just getting me some maybe points. Maybe that. Maybe he knows that. He probably does. Um, do you want to do an early Maya Sable today? Yeah, let's do. So we're gonna hear, we're doing Maya Sable. We're gonna hear from Jose, hear from Abby, and then we'll go to Ronan, and that'll wrap the show. So Maya Sable. Let's so hear it. didn't quite manage to chat to Davide Formula this morning, but he's plummeted out of contention. So we him. can only imagine. Yep. New Maya Sable. Imagine we're probably not gonna be getting a chat with him in the morning. Because it's Tij Benu from Visma Lisa Bike. Oh, no. One hour, two minutes, 19 seconds. But, you know. All right. Congrats, Tij. Speaking of which, uh, after Abby's pin idea, I've had someone reach out uh, who their boyfriend has makes like has a little pin business. And so they've offered, I haven't really read, I haven't read the email fully yet. I just got the Instagram uh, message. So potentially there is actually traction and feasibility to the pin idea. All right. So wait all the way until next year to see if we figure it out. <laughs> we got a year. We got a year to figure it out. Should we head over to the Giro? Yeah, nice. Let's hear from Abby at the Giro. The stage was won by Liana Lippert out of a group of three, formerly four, that went away on the penultimate climb of the day. It's phenomenal to see Lippert back on the top step. Um, she had a stress stress fracture in her hip uh, due to running in the off season. And it's been a really slow start for her back into racing. She didn't race at all in the spring and came back only for the Vuelta. And with Movistar and with Annemiek Van Vluten retiring, she really was kind of teed up to step into the, the top spot at the team. And so it would have been, I think, really hard for her to deal with having to start the season so late and then the slow build up into the year. So this stage win will mean so much to her. And you could tell when she finished the race and her post-race interview that this this one win means a lot to her. And it's just really good to see her back back winning. Yeah, I mean, this was just a display of resilience, right? I mean, to, to be sidelined most of the season, and we know how strong Lippert is in those classic style races, you know, having Anamik retire and then having this opportunity and also that pressure to step up um, and have something like a stress, stress fracture happen in the off season and then sideline you. It was really tough on her, tough on the team, but great to see that she clearly wasn't rushed by the team. Everyone's had a lot of patience. She's clearly had a lot of patience with herself and um, she was just really no motivated today and it was going to come down to her, her and Ruth Winder for sure in that kick and I thought maybe Ruth would would get over the top of her but um, Lippard was just looking a bit stronger on that final climb. You could see Ruth was just hanging on by the skin of her teeth. Um, so an amazing win there and you have to wonder if Shabby had still been in the group how would the finale have gone? I think it would have been way more aggressive, in my opinion. You do have to wonder, and it's such a bummer that she crashed out of that break. She was the the instigator, the one who attacked over the top of that climb, and she finished the race, I think, eight minutes down. Severely injured because she got back on her bike, but the, just the sound she was making, I was really fearful for her in that moment. Yeah, it was good to see her hop back up and be on her feet because then you knew clearly, like, there wasn't a serious, serious injury, mm. but just such a bummer to see her go down. You know, she's she's down to race the Olympics in, in a couple weeks, so it's not just the Giro on the line at the moment. Yeah, it was it was a classic shabby attack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And 
she would have been such a strong asset to that group. And regardless of her being in there or not, it was such a strong breakaway. I mean, Liana Lippert, Tour de France stage winner, Ruth Edwards, former Giro stage winner on her comeback tour, just, just won Turingen after an amazing breakaway on the first stage. Erica McNaldi, she's a really, really good climber as well. And Anne St. Esteban, who like finished in the top 10 of the tour last year. So four really, really strong climbers. And I, I was surprised a little bit that the Peloton let them go. But at the same time, I guess I wasn't because I, none of them were a threat for GC. And I think that both Capecchi and Elisa Longaborghini are quite nervous for the seventh stage. And they did kind of, Capecchi made like a, like a little mm. attack, like on the final climb, she was like, I'm going to test you for a second. And Aliza matched her and then I love that herself. And, <laughs> and then they were like, all right, we're going to, we're going to call it. Like, yeah, yeah. They just like yeah, pull the pin, went back to the group. <laughs> Friend of the pod, Ruth Winder, second today at the Giro. Yeah. Good stuff. All right, let's hear from Jose Bain, who, well, we go into the Pyrenees tomorrow, Saturday. So we're going to talk sheep, wool, and big shepherd's dogs. Hmm. From the outskirts of Po, we leave for a stage in the Pyrenees. The Pyrenees are one of five mountain ranges in France. We also have the Alps, the Vosges Mountains du Jura and the Massif Central. Stage 14 is a relatively short one, which seems to be a trend in recent years. Henri Desgranges, the founder of this race, would have scoffed at stages of 152 kilometers like we have on day 14. We already learned on stages 3 and 4 that Henri was a bit sadistic in the way that he designed his stages and the race rules. In 1910, the Tour de France went to the Pyrenees for the first time. Up the Col d'Aspin, Périssourde, Tourmalet, Soulor, Col de Torte and the Obisque. In one day. It was a stage of 326 kilometers long, but I told you about that story and race leader Octave Lapise last year. You are murderers. Vous êtes des assassins, is what he yelled at the organizers for putting on such a monstrous stage. However, Tour de France boss Henri Desgranges wasn't even present that day the Tourmalet made his debut, and he never actually heard Lapise's words. In 1910, Desgranges had already suffered the wrath of certain competitors. He said that the morale of the troops, starting with that of race leader Octave Lapise, was not very high going into the Pyrenees. Claiming to be indisposed, Desgrange stayed behind in Luchon and entrusted the keys to the race to an assistant named Victor Breyer. He was a boxing fan and Breyer would know exactly how to use his fists if needs be. I couldn't verify whether there was indeed fighting, but the fact is that it wasn't uncommon in the early years of the race, between riders, but also between riders and the organisers. Well, we also pass Lourdes, and the story of Shepherdess Bernadette is quite well known. Little could she have known she would create a tourist attraction in her small town. Being a major tourist hub creates a lot of jobs. One such job is the fireworker. 20 or so fireworkers in the sanctuaries are responsible for cleaning the candle burners every day. There are 23 of them with a capacity of 3,715 candles. And in summer, at the height of the tourist season, there isn't enough room to burn all the candles. They remove the waste from 750 tons of candles burned each year. If you're looking for a job in Lourdes, maybe try Fireworker. Well, talking about work, I just can't even believe that in all these years, I never even talked about dogs. So here we go. The Pyrenees are home to the Pyrenean mountain dog, or Patou. It is even the mascot of saint lary soulon our Finnish town. It's white and fluffy and a gentle giant as a pet in your home. But here in the mountain, it also has a different sight. 
As a working dog, its primary function is to defend the herd of usually sheep against predators. Think about the bears that still live here in the Pyrenees. The patou won't be working with the herd in rounding them like a border collie would, but it serves as their protector. And from this reason, from a very early age on, puppies are placed with the sheep so that they can become accustomed to their new family until they are fully accepted by both parties. The dog will then live permanently with the flock, summer in the mountains and winter in the sheepfold. Many regions in Europe have their own dedicated breed of working dog, but I think the Pyrenean is one of the loveliest. Well, the one I know here in the flatlands. But if you meet one in the mountains, at work, always ask the shepherd or the farmer if the dog is actually friendly to be petted. Otherwise, please just stay clear. Well, should we call up Ronan? Yeah. It's a big story. It's a complicated story. And so, well, it's 3,000 words on the site. But we can talk three thousand words pretty quickly, so we're gonna we're gonna go into I think even more detail here, but mostly just sort of ask him where this all came from. Well, and again, I think that having it discussed on the podcast by Ronan uh, will give it a lot more nuance. I think because yes. it is a nuanced story. There yeah. are you know levels to this, but it's been reported you know very dedicatedly, is that rigorously, <laughs> rigorously, I rigorously. Mean, yeah, Ronan, Ronan's versions. original transcript was a lot longer. <laughs> Many versions. So much detail. Many versions. All right, let's uh, let's ring up Ronan. Hey, Ronan. Hey, Gilly. Where are you? I'm in Rockbrun, which is just between Nice and the f- Italian border. Sounds lovely. Mm. You gonna go ride the Madone tomorrow? I have a plan to do so. I have a bike that I need to review for. Thursday, I think, uh, that I have with me specifically because I have to do that. <laughs> um, so at some point, I'll probably ride the Madonna. It's not the Madonna there I have with me. I don't know if you're allowed oh, to ride. you're not riding Madonna in the Madonna because that I'm, would be I'm, nice. I'm not sure if you're allowed to ride other bikes in the Madonna, but it's not a Madonna <laughs> that I have with me. Let's get right into what we want to talk about here. So today we published a story uh, about carbon monoxide inhalation uh, and how that sort of technique can be used for two different purposes, one of which is currently being used in the Pro Peloton. The measurement method or the, or the measurement technique is being used in the Pro Peloton to essentially track riders' response to altitude. And that then allows teams to tailor riders' altitude camps in, in whatever way, right? So, you, so if you know that a rider isn't particularly good at responding to altitude, maybe they don't have to be up there as long. Maybe if they don't respond to altitude at all, which some don't, Maybe they don't go to altitude at all. So that's the kind of thing that they're using this, this test for. Uh, the test requires breathing in carbon monoxide, which, I don't know, on the face of it seems a bit weird. But this is a, 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 it's a test that's been used for, what, 20, 25 years? For a long time. And then the other side of this is something that's currently being researched, uh, which is essentially taking the same thing you would do for the measurement and just doing it more frequently. So it's basically a question of frequency. Uh, And that, in early studies, has been shown to provide uh, similar changes in essentially like blood profiles to going to altitude itself or to to the changes that that line up with things that we know tend to result in in better performance on a bicycle. So there's sort of interest in this side of of uh, or in this particular technique because of that, because there's there's potential performance gains to be had. But if we step all the way, all the way, all the way back, I want you to tell a little bit of a story into like how we ended up here, because we didn't start here. We started with just sort of big questions, right? Yeah, it actually almost goes back almost exactly a year when we witnessed Jonas Vinigo basically won the Tour de France in the stage 17 time trial, was it in 2023? And off the back of that, I mean, I think the entire cycling community had you know, questions, how is this possible, whatever, and we started looking into it. We, you know, interviewed a few members of the team and all at that time and sort of presented what we knew at, at that point about some of the optimization work the team had done for the time trial. And it was a considerable amount of work. They had they had found tangible and pretty smart gains for that stage. Uh, but what we were hearing about at the time was what was being called super altitude, uh, which 
didn't really make much sense to me at the time because I didn't really have the, f- the full picture to piece together. And yeah, that, that, that process of sort of looking into what is super altitude, what, what does that term mean? What does it mean the writers are doing? What does it mean the teams are doing? Um, and somewhere along that process, we ended up talking to um, a researcher, a professor named Bent Ronestad, um, and simultaneously stumbled upon a, a device called the, the Talo Performance, uh, which is a, a CO or carbon monoxide rebreather. And that's the device that the teams are using for the measurement purposes, for measuring how much hemoglobin mass a, a writer has. Uh, or measuring a writer's hemoglobin mass. And at the time, I mean, you look back now and you go, yeah, it makes more sense. But at the time, it just, you know, the, fu- the, full, the full thing didn't really piece together. Um, and, you know, carbon monoxide was, in hindsight, the sort of missing, missing piece of the puzzle. And that's where if we fast forward through another, what, 10 months or so of, of sort of just wondering what is this and trying to figure it out and trying to piece it bits together, uh, we get to the Science and Cycling Conference a week before the Tour de France, where Daniele Cardinale, another professor who worked with Bent Ronestad, made a presentation on carbon monoxide inhalation and what some of the performance gains that, that you just mentioned there, what, what may be possible. Now, the results from that study aren't published yet, and um, Cardinale wouldn't share them with us until they are. Um, but we spoke to people who were at that presentation, and we spoke to a considerable number of other people with expertise in the field. And yeah, that's, that's sort of, that's how we, how we got to where we are now. And I want to make a couple things really clear. So when we say that we started with this question of like, how did Jonas Finke go do that time trial last year? We're not saying that we have the answer today, hmm. right? We're saying that we have another piece of that puzzle, just in the same way that heat training was a piece of that puzzle. Mm-hmm. And the piece of that puzzle, again, to be very, very clear, is we're not saying, because there is no proof of this, that Visma Lisa Bike Jonas Vingago, are using this inhalation method for performance gains. What we are saying is that they are using the inhalation method because all this gets very confusing. Sort of. Let, uh, let's uh, actually just clarify that they, while you're they on the point. They're using the rebreather yes, method, yes. <laughs> to, which is the same thing, just less frequent, uh, to measure the effect of altitude mm. on those riders. And that in itself is a gain because better understanding of how their riders react to altitude is the gain that we are talking about. We are not talking about Jonas Vingago breathing carbon monoxide at the sort of dosages and frequencies that are being studied. We are talking about them using the measurement and that data to improve his performance. There's a, it's a really important line there and what we actually know and what we don't know. But one of the things that is part of the story because we think it's very relevant, is how close the sort of the next step actually is, uh, just in terms of like logistics and the devices used and things like that. Mm. I think it's very important. Like we do absolutely urge everybody to, who's listening to this to go and actually read the entire article because it's you do need to read the full thing to get the full picture of of what we're discussing here. Uh, but also just on that, the the rebreathing method is a measurement. It's a test. It's something that. You may get done in a hospital if you went in for some sort of uh, inspection, looking for a better word, but that's the word I'm going to go with. <laughs> um, what does Melissa Bike have told us they're doing in terms of the rebreathing measurement method is they do it once before an altitude camp commences. Bent Ronestad is on site to conduct that test. He brings the equipment with him, and then the riders do their three week altitude block, whatever it might be. And then they, re- they redo the measurement test at the end of the altitude block. So that's, they're literally inhaling carbon monoxide twice in a three week period, intentionally inhaling it twice, versus what some are concerned may be a small step and may already be happening in sport is that carbon monoxide inhalation method, which sounds the same, but actually it's, it, although it's actually pretty much a similar process. What that actually involves and what Cardinelli's study presented was actually inhaling carbon monoxide twice per day intentionally for a three-week period. You know, there, there, there's, a, there's a big difference there between once at the start Huge and once difference. at the end and twice a day for three weeks. So that's yeah. very important to clarify that. And we, and we made a, a large effort to separate these things within the story. Uh, they're in the same story because they are fundamentally the same technique in different frequencies, right? And the inhalation 
method, the which is, again, sort of intended to find performance gains in the actual inhalation of the carbon monoxide itself, that is being studied. And that's the reason why we, why we thought it was so interesting and thought it was worth including and thought it was needed to be a big part of the story. Because there were, like you said, there was this presentation ahead of the Tour de France that was attended by representatives from many world tour teams, many Tour de France teams on this exact thing on uh, it was research into using carbon monoxide to essentially improve blood values i think the other thing kelly is just that as you mentioned being able to measure hemoglobin mass uh, it's important to clarify that 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 is something new that is a new option for these teams and that is not, and only a few teams are doing it that is not an option that comes cheaply either you have access through a research study like visma did with bent ronestad or you pay what we believe is fifty thousand euros for one of these for the, for one of the devices that's actually able to do it uh, in an accurate and a fast and a safe way. That alone, like the the richest teams will have the best access to altitude anyway, and this is another step in that the the richest teams have now a way to further optimize that and sort of open the gap. And that 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 may be okay. That that's you know the the it's it's also important to say that neither the UCI nor WADA have specifically said this is banned although it's a little bit of a gray area and so yeah that that i think that's when we spoke to all their teams and you know they're telling us that this is uh that 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 they, they won't even consider the rebreathing method um, and others are saying that yeah this is controversial because these teams have access to this i believe that's part of the reason why is because it's it, it, it's like it's like so much so much a high performance sport there are the have not haves and have nots mm-hmm. and this time the haves have a toxic gas also. So that kind of makes it a bit easier for the have-nots to be outraged. <laughs> yeah. So I guess just to reiterate, what we know right now is there are three teams currently using the rebreather method to measure hemoglobin mass, usually like before and after altitude camps. And they're using that data to improve their altitude camps. They're using their data, that data to improve their athletes. Just, just you know, straight up data analytics. Uh, finding out how altitude affects those riders in, in various ways and, and, and optimizing in that way. How concerned are we about the other, the inhalation method? Like, so, so this is a bit, this is controversial for sure. Like we, we spoke to multiple sort of sports science folks and some won't touch it. Uh, some found it very sort of like normal to be looking into it. And there is sort of a role, it's always the role of science, right? Is to kind of push the boundaries and, and not necessarily ask the ethical questions beforehand, you know, maybe, maybe there should be a little, bit, a little bit more of that. Yeah. Are we concerned that there is, that this is happening in cycling or elsewhere? I mean, on the one hand, you look around your room at home and you see a carbon monoxide alarm and you think, well, everybody knows how dangerous this is. Surely nobody would go there. But on the other hand, we're talking about a sport where riders have literally botched blood transfusions themselves at homes at home to try and land themselves in the hospital almost dying an attempt to get a gain and so it's it's concerning because as was described to us by one expert it's a very very small step from rebreathing measurement method to carbon monoxide inhalation presumably the bigger step is from not doing this at all to doing the rebreathing measurement because that yeah that that you first of all have to have someone with the expertise to to do that test uh, and there, there, you know, there, there is an argument that if you have someone with that expertise, then perhaps this is okay. I think the concern, though, is that as more and more study is done, as more and more research papers are published, and as the understanding of this increases, then the risk of writers thinking, well, that doesn't seem that difficult. I, I could try this and then getting it wrong. And it's important to mention that it's not just the writer who is inhaling the carbon monoxide who is at risk while they're inhaling it. The, the risk stems from getting the dosage wrong to start with, but then also transporting and administering CO, CO, the carbon monoxide. It puts everybody in that room at risk. If there's a leak there that they haven't spotted, and remembering this is an odorless, colorless, smellless, tasteless gas. If, there, if there's a leak while they're extracting from the canister and putting it into the device, then you know that, that puts everybody who's in that room at that point at risk. And you know they're... There, there could be, there could be countless other ways that it could put other innocent people at risk, also. So, um, I think the big concern is just athletes experimenting, um, but there are those other concerns that are equally valid. I think. Yeah, I guess just to, um, just to be really clear, I mean, carbon monoxide is a is a deadly gas because it binds to your hemoglobin in your blood better than oxygen does. 
So it takes those, those spots that would normally be taken by oxygen. And then as your blood circulates and it tries to drop off what should be oxygen to your tissues and muscles, it has none. And so you, you, it's, it's, it's the reason why inhaling it, we probably should have said this right at the start, <laughs> it's the reason why inhaling it can have effects very similar to altitude because it, it creates a, a, a hypoxia just like altitude does. Uh, it is actually starving your body of oxygen. And that's the reason why it can also kill you. And it's the also it's part of the reason why it's so dangerous is because it's not just like you step outside and you're fine. It's already binded to your blood and it's in there for hours. And if you take too much, it's kind of too late for you unless you can get to a very specialized hospital very, very quickly. So it's an incredibly dangerous thing. The teams were very careful to tell us and very adamant when they were telling us that like this, we only use it in this very specific way. A very controlled environment with real experts. But part of the reason why we felt we, we needed to write this story is this is starting to get around and starting to get out. And the dangers need to be discussed. And the sport needs to have a conversation about those dangers. Regardless of whether you feel like Jonas Vingigo using this, this you know, rebreather measurement testing is, is ethical or not, that, that, that's, that's a totally separate question. We're looking a little bit into the future and saying, you know, if this is coming, if the research is coming, and it's going to start, again, trickling out to folks who do not have the same level of expertise uh, in their back room, right? That, that conversation needs to start right now. And, and WADA needs to be having that conversation. The UCI needs to be having that conversation. Cycling as a whole needs to be having that conversation. Unfortunately, we didn't get the sense from either WADA or the UCI that they are having those conversations. And it's worth mentioning that we all unintentionally inhale a little carbon monoxide probably every day. It's in the environment. It's especially if you live in urban environments. And so actually setting like a threshold or banning this substance is, is going to be difficult for them. Uh, you know, we, ha we, have to, we have to acknowledge that. But surely the, the, the method is something they should at least be looking into or at least having conversations or, or discussions around. Well, I think, we, I think we'll cut it off there because frankly, we were, we we're almost a little wary to do this in a podcast because it's frankly like I'm not a scientist. You're not a scientist. We're reporters. We take the information, we try to distill it, we, we put it into a story, right? And we can do that in a very careful manner in, in written copy. You know, you and I both know how many, how many iterations of this story existed prior to the actual publishing. Uh, a lot. Mm. <laughs> Whereas it's a little bit more difficult in, in, this, in, the, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in this format, I guess, to, to make sure we get everything right. So we're a little bit wary of going too deep into the details. Uh, but yeah, I, I, we just wanted to provide a little more insight into where this came from, why we think it was important, and I guess the sort of the basics of the story. But we do, I don't know, we implore you, go, go read the thing. Read the whole thing. Because yeah, there's a lot of moving parts in it, and it, it, it can be a lot to digest. Um, but it's important. It's important for, for cycling, we think. No After Dark today. We've had a, bi we've had a big week. <laughs> uh, has, uh, has there ever been a phone into the Tour Daily previously? I, I don't recall one. Uh, no, this is the first tour daily phone in, I think. Mm. Yeah. Well, we'll be back tomorrow from somewhere relatively near Pope. Sa yeah, yeah, yeah. It's St. Larry Soulon. We're going into the, into the, into the Pyrenees tomorrow. We finished with an ore category uphill finish. That's going to be good stuff. Mm. All right. Well, Ronan, thank you for your incredible work reporting this piece. We'll, uh, we'll stay on top of the story. Obviously, I think we will not be the only ones asking teams some questions in the next couple of days. That was sort of the other reason to, to get this thing out, uh, is to get our fellow reporters in the game as well. So yeah, keep an eye on, on the story, and, and we will update you here on the pod as things change, if they do. And we'll see you tomorrow. Bye, everybody. Bye.